Hi everyone, um, I'm so excited to be here and to be able to talk to you all about um, the research that I've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, and so just a little introduction about myself. Um, I'm Sierra and um, so I'm from the United States and if I ever talk too fast, just like let me know and I'll slow down. Um, but I, yeah, like Camila said, I received my bachelor's from the University of Oklahoma in biology and um, I just kind of skipped ahead to a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology um, at the same university. And so my kind of passion and um, love for conservation started at a really young age. And so I would watch nature documentaries and wildlife shows all the time and um, just really started to develop an interest in conservation and um, of wildlife in particular. And so I was really interested in science and pursuing that as a career, but I didn't really know how I was going to be able to um, do conservation research in the future. And so when I started my undergraduate degree at OU, I took a field-based course, and um, it's called field herpetology. And so herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And so this course um, was really interesting because we got hands-on experience with um, catching animals and doing applied research during this kind of two-week course when we were outside and in the like ponds and in the streams and really getting to see this biodiversity um, hands-on was really amazing. And the instructor of that course uh, was named Cameron Seiler. And so after that course, I started working with Cameron as an undergraduate researcher in his lab. And um, he kind of exposed me to uh, this kind of research avenues that I could pursue as a career potentially. And so I um, kind of latched on to this idea of uh, studying the health of reptiles and amphibians. And um, Cameron's lab has a lot of different uh, kind of everybody in the lab kind of has different avenues of research that they're pursuing. But kind of the main objective of Cameron's lab is exploration and conservation of reptiles and amphibians, particularly in the Philippines. And so there is kind of this global loss of biodiversity everywhere. And so the objective of Cameron's lab is to kind of explore the patterns of um, the species, the distributions, and the phylogenetic relationships between the species and how we can um, conserve them and conserve their habitat. And so particularly, I was uh, kind of blown away by how threatened amphibian species are. And nearly one third of all, all amphibian species are facing declines or extinction. And there are a couple of reasons why this is happening, and these can be like applied to other taxa as well. And, um, but what I kind of noticed was all of these studies being published on just how um, kind of how dire the need is to do this research of amphibian infectious diseases and how they're uh, impacting communities at a broader scale. And so a little bit about these infectious diseases, there are kind of three main amphibian infectious diseases. Two are fungal and one is viral. So the two fungal uh, pathogens, BD, is, uh, infects frogs, and B. sal only infects salamanders. And um, luckily, there's no B. sal in the Philippines, um, but I'm interested in kind of sampling the frog communities in the Philippines and um, kind of uh, looking at BD infection in particular. So there are a couple of active research areas in the broader scale of amphibian infectious diseases. So there's kind of monitoring and detection. And so you can um, monitor a site that has previously experienced infection and uh, detecting new sites that not necessarily, the communities aren't really infected yet. And so um, both this area is really important, especially um, in areas that are uh, have species of like greatest conservation concern and so species that are really rare um, it's important to monitor sites where they're found to make sure that the health of the community is um, intact. So
So um, the other kind of area is species resistance. And so there's species that can actually have the pathogen and be infected by the pathogen, but not die from it. But they can be carriers of the pathogen and spread it to other species that may be more susceptible to infection. And so one like kind of novel case is uh, the American bullfrog. And it's an invasive species in the Philippines, and it can carry the pathogen and, and essentially be resistant to the effects. But when it comes into contact with water where other species are present, or skin-to-skin -skin contact with other uh, species that may be more susceptible, it can infect those individuals just by being in the same area. And so there's a lot of active research on what species are resistant and can be carriers versus what species are more susceptible to mortality events and being infected. And the area that I'm uh, really interested in is kind of the relationship between skin bacteria and um, the presence of the, this, uh, this infectious disease kitchen. And so um, I am interested in looking at what communities of bacteria, um, so the kind of the phylum, the uh, taxa of bacteria that are present when an amphibian is infected versus bacteria that may be um, helping in the uh, animal's ability to fight off the pathogen. And so, um, a little bit more information about what Kitchert is. It's a fungal pathogen that inhibits the frog's ability to breathe through its skin. And so um, frogs absorb uh, moisture and they absorb kind of oxygen through their skin. And so when this bacteria gets on um, their skin and infects them, then they lose that ability to breathe. And so they basically just die from um, cardiac arrest. They just can't get enough oxygen. And um, it can spread rapidly in the community because it's transferred in water. And so um, if an infected individual like sloughs off the pathogen into the water, it can infect other individuals present in that water body. Um, and it can, uh, in the species where it is particularly um, harmful, it can cause massive mortality events. And in the neotropics, which is Central and South America, this pathogen is actually like caused extinction of an entire species and um, has caused a lot of death of amphibians all throughout the um, central, south, and North America region. And um, it basically, so uh, like kind of my interest in research is um, this idea that this pathogen affects the, micro, my, the microbial communities that are present on the skin and those microbial communities serve a lot of different purposes. So they're symbiotic with the host. And we don't really know all the function that the microbes can have, but we do know that they can kind of, microbes are so important for the health of the organism. And so when you eliminate those bacterial communities, you're eliminating the other beneficial effects that those microbes might have had with the host. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword where you're, the, the individual is infected and sick, but it's also losing um, kind of critical bacteria that help it um, live just generally um, and potentially fight off the pathogen as well. So as I started getting involved in Cameron's lab and started pursuing independent research, I um, began to be really interested in the Philippines generally. And so um, Cameron has an active research program in the Philippines and has worked here for close to 20 years now. And uh, he took me along with um, a few other students on two expeditions, uh, one in 2017 and one in 2018. This is actually my third visit to the Philippines. And we were able to collect samples from kind of those mid, of uh, those two little dots on Luzon, like the uh, Luzon mainland in 2017 and sampling amphibian communities on those two, at those two sites. And then in 2018, we went to the Babuian Island group, which is the northernmost island group, um, and sampled frog communities present on those islands as well. And what was interesting is that even though this pathogen is causing these massive die-offs in infection rates in the neotropics, we're really not seeing that level of infection here. And so, I, I was kind of uh, surprised by this because 
um, what is making the amphibians in the Philippines different from these other amphibian communities? And what's also interesting is that a study was published from um, some folks at the Nas National Museum of History. And they found that um, Mount Palaipalai, which is down in Cavite, uh, the amphibian communities there experienced uh, a high level of infection. And so now I'm thinking, what is different from infinite communities on this mountain versus the sites that we sampled in um, the paper that we just published? And so this study in particular, kind of why I'm here, is to assess infection presence and um, sample the skin bacteria of frogs from Mount Black Life and compare those to the bacteria and uh, infection rate of other mountains across Luzon and down into the Bicol Peninsula. So um, the red dot shows Plebla, and um, those black dots represent sites that are deemed to be uh, chytrid absent or chytrid not sampled yet. Uh, and so there's a lot of going on, like a lot of sites, but um, this is kind of going to be an ongoing research project that I hopefully get to return to the Philippines and keep. Um, kind of researching. And so along with comparing mountain to mountain, I'm interested in kind of zooming in to uh, elevational gradients. And so dividing each mountain into different elevational gradients and comparing um, the presence of chytrid and the what bacterial communities are um, changing with elevation as you kind of increase. And so um, it's kind of interesting because Chytrid is known to be uh, affected by um, temperature and precipitation. And so as you increase the elevation, the uh, temperature and precipitation levels change as well. And so I'm interested in how, um, as you kind of change where you're at on the mountains, how are uh, the amphibians, the health of the amphibians changing as well. And um, you can kind of answer a few of more questions with this kind of elevational gradient as well is that um, what species are uh, what species are present at different elevations and um, what kind of habitat types are at each elevation and so um, yeah so I'm interested in how like comparing mountain to mountain and then also the communities present uh, along the mountain itself and so to Screen for chytrid, you basically just swab the frog. So you swab on its belly, on its sides, and on its back and legs. And then you extract the DNA from the swab. And then you can use a quantitative PCR machine. And um, if you want to know more information about that, I'll, I'll tell you. But uh, basically, it's just a machine that can test if the individual was infected or not. And so, um, and then it can also tell you how infected the animal was based on the number of gene copies of the pathogen was present in the sample. And um, with, the micro, with the microbiome sampling, you do the first two steps the same. You swab the frog, then you extract the DNA, but the um, kind of downstream of, uh, processes are a little more complicated. And again, if you want to know that, I'll tell you, but it's a lot of jargon kind of. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of how you do it. And it's a really cool um, method because it's not invasive to the frog. They don't have to um, die to get the sample. Um, and they can, they're pretty much, I mean, uh, whether, I mean, they're a little uncomfortable when you're swallowing them. But other than that, it's really not um, an invasive process at all. And um, so even though my research is focused on disease and microbiome, when I do these general surveys, you get a lot of information from these individuals. And so um, these surveys are so important because they can provide so much more data than your original research kind of focuses on. And so even though I'll be focusing on these elevational gradients and comparing mountains and uh, swabs, so, so many swabs, uh, I can still collect generally and sample the reptile and amphibian diversity at these sites as well. And we can collect all sorts of data from these kind of um, research expeditions and things like that. 
And so, yeah, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to uh, be able to spend an extended period of time in the Philippines. The, my past trips have only been for a month, and now I'm here for 10. So I'm so excited. And um, you guys have really, really cool reptile and amphibian diversity. It's really awesome. And so I'm just so grateful to be here. And thank you so much for coming and listening to me. Um, so here are my collaborators and my funding sources. And if you have any questions, I would love to take them. between chytrid fungus and the bacterial communities on the skin um, in the neotropics. And so there's a few labs from the United States that have sampled amphibian communities in Central and South America, um, but that same research has not been done in the Philippines quite yet. Yeah. Um, and so we do have an idea of the, the bacteria that are kind of um, predicted to help fight the pathogen and the bacteria that are predicted to um, be absent when chytrid is present, if that makes sense. And so chytrid can kind of um, inhibit certain bacteria from persisting on the frog. And so you can kind of um, see changes in the bacteria that are present based on if the frog is infected or not. And so these, these phylum and families of bacteria have been documented, um, but every individual, um, has a different microbiome, if that makes yeah. sense. And so, and especially different species of frogs can have different bacteria on their skin. And so it's hard to kind of compare frogs that are so different in their ecology, like, cause they're from a, the completely opposite side of the world. And um, so it's a little difficult to compare, but you, you can make some comparisons. Um, yeah, cause I've been working in collaboration with a uh, uh, Spanish, uh, Herpetologist, mm -hmm. we are we will be doing something similar, but the focus is Palawan. Okay. If you're trying to compare microbiomes mm -hmm. uh, between space and time, yeah. because they had uh, long years of data from somewhere Puerto Rico area, mm -hmm. and they would like to those, and they they have other spots out there, but we'll be comparing. Mm -hmm. It's like mountain and habitat comparisons. Very in microbiome also. Awesome. And so doing this in Mount Makiling, mm -hmm. for me, would be an interesting uh, information because we can also compare Luzon for yeah. Mount Makiling and Palawan. Yeah, absolutely. The study here is going to start by May. Okay. In Palawan. Awesome. Wow, that's really great. If you want to go to McKeeling, let me know. It's the Natural History of Hadley, a museum of Hadley. Awesome. Wow, that's very interesting. Very cool. So when I heard about what you are going to do, actually, I, I got excited. No, I didn't yeah. have time to meet up with you. But well, let me know if you want to. I'm yeah, here for a long let's time. Yeah, let's talk over dinner or something. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering, um, you said the American book. Um, yes, are there yes, other, yes. Is there other avenues where mm -hmm. they, uh, the fungus could go in? I don't know. Especially in the Philippines has a high non-native population of cane toads. Mm. So I'm wondering if it, yeah, uh, cane toads. I'm wondering if they could also be carriers of the fungus itself. Yeah, so the um, invasive species generally um, 
can, when, you, when they're coming in from, say a cane toad comes in from uh, mainland Asia or um, Australia or places that may have higher prevalence of BD, they can absolutely bring it into the Philippines, which is unfortunate. And they, cane toads, as everybody knows, can spread rapidly. Mm -hmm. And um, as they spread into the Philippines, then yeah, they can most definitely carry the pathogen and um, spread it to communities. Um, so yeah, the, the bullfrog I just mentioned, um, because it's really, uh, really caused um, kind of a massive mortality event in Japan. And so that was just the first one that came to my head, but cane toads definitely are one of this one. Just follow up, I'm just wondering, if the fungus is an example, it's already present, and is there any way to stop the fungus? Is, so like yeah, so there's um, labs, there's a lab in Australia and a lab or two in the United States that are actually um, experimentally trying to develop a probiotic um, and kind of almost a cure. Uh, and so that's great in theory, um, but uh, environmentally, I'm, I'm not sure if releasing a uh, kind of lab-made cure, we don't really know how that would affect the, the environment as a whole. So it would be great if we could, yeah, just drop something into this water and it, the frogs get cured from the, the um, infection, but it's hard to determine what effect that would have on the environment as a, as a whole, and the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so yeah, it's a great idea, and I would love to see these frogs, you know, kind of healed from this. But you know, there's no really, there's no way to tell the kind of downstream effects it would have. So um, in the states, I don't know. I'm just wondering. In the states, what's the update of the fungus in yeah the tinted fungus in the sea? So yeah. Um, it kind of depends where you are. There's been um, massive mortality events in California um, and in certain regions of the United States, but uh, I published another paper actually um, surveying the amphibian communities from Oklahoma, the state that I'm from, and uh, you do see kind of like a 30 to 40 percent infection rate, um, so still high, um, but it seems to be the concentration of the pathogen is seems to be in Central America, um, but it does get into the United States, and we do see a much higher prevalence compared to um, the Philippines, for example. Yeah. Um, you've shown a picture, and you show that there's a Limonectes pisanos, yeah. and the Limonectes macrocephalus, which are infected mm -hmm. by target fungus. Yes. But uh, based on the study, there, uh, I'm just, I just want to clarify only, um, because those uh, type of palm frogs are really, their habitat type is uh, clean streams. Mm. So what do you think is the factor why they got that, aside from the Limonectus woodworthi, which can thrive on a disturbed area? Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and again, when these species are uh, infected, it was like one out of like 30 individuals. And so the, the infection rate is still really low, but I'm not sure what's different about like the host's ecology that affects the presence of pitcher. I'm not sure. Um, but it's really interesting uh, question to ask for sure. Yes? I always thought that about pitcher is because of the massive die-out of a lot of species in South America, we always think about it as something that is an extinction level event yeah. for, for frogs. But there is always that kind of balance for some species yeah. where you get um, infected, but you don't actually die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be a good proxy for, say, um, would that be a good proxy for, say, thickness? Yeah, yeah, honestly. And there is actually, there was a paper published relatively recently <coughs> basically hypothesizing that frogs in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia in general are experiencing these low levels of infection because they've already un undergone um, infection in the past. And so there's this hypothesis that the um, strain of chytrid that's causing the massive die-offs originated in Asia. And so these frogs have already undergone and kind of natural selection um, did its work and now they're immune to the pathogen. 
And so there's this, there's no way to necessarily confirm that, but there is like this hypothesis in the paper published in Nature, and it was like a big, big deal, yeah. And um, so, yeah, if you're interested, I can send that to you for sure. But um, yeah, so there, it's kind of interesting to kind of see uh, natural selection of the frogs that are kind of immune to it, but also there's natural selection going on with the skin microbiome as well. And so um, the kind of the bacteria that can help fight off the pathogen, there's this like kind of um, uh, arms race going on on the skin, but also between individuals. So it's, it's there's so many layers to this research. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about another aspect of your thesis working on altitudinal distribution, mm -hmm. so essentially diversity surveillance. Right. Uh, a lot of this has been done in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Angel Alcala, Reef, Arvin, mm -hmm. Tower, right. of course. Right. Uh, is there an overarching hypothesis that would actually tell you what's the distributional pattern, of the altitudinal distribution pattern mm -hmm. of these subdivision reptiles? Yeah, um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of these pioneer right. herpetologists that have there's done this work. Yeah. But, yeah, and um, I'm kind of, I will be doing these, hopefully contributing to these uh, kind of faunal surveys that, uh, you know, Rafe and Cameron and um, everybody has been kind of trying to piece together of like species of the Philippines, like snakes of the Philippines and geckos of the Philippines and contribute to that greater body of work. But my research specifically is with the elevational gradients is um, the changes of the bacteria on the skin and the, and the pathogen. So my, so even though, yeah, this work has been done, I mean, there's been years and years and years of data um, on elevational gradients and distribution patterns. I'm kind of zooming in um, onto those comparisons in particular. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, no, no, don't apologize. You're good. So, I just, you, I just, on this gender effects, I know there's a, one for salamanders, there's one for frogs. Yeah. Uh, does this affect yeah. Sicilians, especially since uh, the Philippines have several species? I know. Yeah, no, I'm super interested in that. I can never, I mean, I've only been here twice for these kind of surveys, but since I can't find Sicilians. <laughs> if you can find Sicilians, I would love to sample them. That'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'm not sure. I would think, I don't know. I don't know what, which one they would be infected by, but yeah. Um, I have three points. One is, uh, will there be, will you be including interspecies uh, comparative uh, back analysis? Mm -hmm. Like you have communities, yep. of course you'll find different species of, of amphibians out there, and so you compare. concept of your possible, what would be your expected um, endings? Predictions. Yeah, predictions for, oh, the, predictions. for, your, for your research. Would um, you have something in mind already such that, like for example, no? since the trees are more sensitive to temperature, yeah. we would assume somehow that in the higher altitudes, mm -hmm. There will be more possibilities of tree uh, yeah. ascents and absolutely. also the extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Kittred kind of seems to uh, uh, grow rapidly and, and uh, persist in colder temperatures. And so, I would assume at higher elevations that Kittred would be more present. But then you also have this um, kind of idea that the, high, the higher altitudes are going to be less disturbed. And so it's. I'm interested in looking at these. Is it is it temperature? Is it the lack of disturbance or the presence of disturbance? There's just kind of there's so many players in this in this kind of um, hypothesis that we, we don't really know. I don't I don't know if it's. How will you protect yourself from being a carrier of the picture? Yeah, that's a huge. Uh, yeah, I know it's a it's a huge problem. How will problem. you ensure that you are not the one going to carry the picture? Yeah. Yeah, so you bleach the bottom of your 
boots when you go when you go into um, so different I'm water bodies. That's great. That's great. Well, I won't. 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 I won't.
I, uh, I have to ask Philip for his batanes and babuyan. So that's batanes, this is babuyan, and yes. this is a pari. Yes, so it's in between. So the almost uh, higher in our uh, latitude is the yeah. uh, Batani side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes ma'am. Um, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, yes, these are all the species. Um, from oh, so you've got a lot of them. From, yeah. all, yeah. from all sides. Um, Together. But off of my, off the top. This of, is babuya. No, no, no. This is all sites. Negros. Uh, all sites. Yeah, Negros, Luzon, and. Uh, yeah, but I don't think you will find that diversity. No. In so island. off of the top of my head of what we collected in Babuya, it was like Rhinella. It was like Oxidazyga. Yeah. Obviously, like the very common ones. Potty mantis in Babuya. Uh, but if you're interested, I can send you a, a list of what we collected from Babuyans in okay, uh, yeah. particular. Because I have the publication that has species mm -hmm. broken up by site. So mm -hmm. I'll send you that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. There's this guy uh, from the great bass. Uh, Vance, Vance Greenberg? Yes. Uh, you've been doing slobbing for the last most of the time. 2010. Yeah, 2010. You published a study um, in, in California. Yes, um, but his, if I'm not mistaken, I believe his lab is interested in um, doing Southeast Asian work with kitchen. Don't quote me on that. But I think I think that they have have spoken about an interest of doing that. Um, but I'm not sure if they have uh, pursued that yet. Um, but they've done a lot of work. Um, uh, with uh, kind of frog communities in California, but yeah. But they haven't published yet after 2011. I remember when you did 2012. Uh, I'm not sure. I, you might have papers from him, but I, I only know about the 2010 paper. Yeah, from I Reaper. think I only have the the Asian wide, Southeast Asian wide uh, from Sway. So, yeah. So the only studies that have been published um, of uh, amphibian infection in Southeast Asia are a study in 2011 by Sway et al. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2011. And um, it was kind of a, Philippines was included in a broader Southeast Asian um, chytrid presence. Um, and then the this paper from okay. May Desmos. Uh, and so there's really just those two and then the one I just published in December. So there's a need. So if you're interested in amphibian disease, this is a great place to do it because um, there's kind of uh, not very much information on it, on the Philippines. More questions before? Questions? <laughs> I'm just uh, yeah interested in the the one you show the no pathogen detection. Mm -hmm. So most, uh, we're saying a while ago that Brangella can be a culprit for the transfer of the, but out of four, four sites, I think uh, so. Eight. Ah, eight sites, no, no pathogen detected for Brangella. No. So yeah, and it's it's it's, inter it's, yeah, very, it's very interesting. interesting why there's no pathogen. Yeah, right. Yeah, I it. know. The chytrids die out of the skin poison, you know, that antibiotic. Even for oxidizaga. Yeah, I was really surprised. Oxidizaga had no prevalence. That's just really surprising. They just they live in yeah, they live in the ponds and they live in really disturbed ponds as well, and so I was really surprised at that. I'm just curious about the Platymantis sp3, uh, yeah. since it has two, two detection. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's a arboreal species, or ground species? Yeah, or I'm not sure. Um, okay. Yeah, I would have to go back. And, I Again, I have a data file where it has uh, kind of a short description yeah. of its habitat. It's that's very interesting. If yeah, and that one climate is out of the, what's making it different from the other two. Um, yeah, very interesting questions. Is that from Mount Palali? Yes. Sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mount Palali had. What television? I did a mammal. 500 meters? Oh, it's high. Still below the forest climate. 
Oh, it was, no, it was forested oh. where we were at. But it was, there was like hiking trails and things like that. Um, and we did sample a higher elevation, um, which was where we found Sangarana. Both Sangarana species um, were present at the higher elevation, which was more like above 1,000 meters. Um, and yeah, so it was not nearly at the base of the It was still a little disturbed, um, but not as bad as like we went to the dot right um, above Pulali on uh, Luzon was Gatarin, which was like really disturbed. Um, and so it's interesting that there's no infection there. So there's just so much going on here. There's so many different, uh, what's that? <laughs> That's why yeah. I just started to Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if you've tried um, using it back to the anything? No. Uh, no. Uh, no. So I have but not. Is it possible? It is possible. It is possible to detect BD and the other pathogen rhinovirus from uh, environmental DNA. <coughs> so you can do both. Uh, our lab has done environmental DNA, but with kind of different objectives. Um, different kind of goals. We haven't done it to detect pathogens, but yeah, it has been done. Yeah. 